we hike the permanently frozen lands of Tombstone Park in the Yukon, a land famous for northern lights, stunning landscapes, and bears. We venture to the far north for a chance to backpack through the land that many call the Patagonia of the North. In this video, we're going to go over everything you need to know to make sure that you're prepared for Tombstone and you can have a great time. There's a few things you need before you set off to Tombstone Park. Well, for one, you need a permit. I'll go into how to get a permit shortly, but there's a few other things in terms of bear control, making sure that you're safe from bears. It is bear country. However, it's important to know bears aren't frequently spotted in the park. However, that's mainly because people have been doing a very good job at not attracting them. So you'll need a bear can. A bear can is something that you put your food into and scented items and make sure that you store them in bear lockers. But the bear can makes it very hard for the bears to get to the food, even if you mess up and put him in a wrong spot because the bear can't get the food most likely the bear's not going to come the next thing you'll need and on honestly you probably won't need it and it's best if you don't need it however in worst case you will want a bear spray now bear spray cannot be flown with so you'll have to buy it somewhere uh local we bought ours in whitehorse but it is something that you'll want as a last resort. If needed, that bear spray could save your life, so it's fairly worthwhile. And unfortunately, you know, recycle them or leave them somewhere. It's, it's really unfortunate. I wish they had like a recycle program and a way of like trading these bear sprays to people who are coming and, and just have them at the park, but they don't have such a system. But you will want bear spray for the off chance that you do spot a bear and I can go into a little bit of safety of how to use this bear spray shortly. Other things you'll need, aside from the basic gear that you'll need for camping and backpacking, being hiking poles, the hiking boots, and, and the normal things you would bring, maybe I should make a whole other video for that in the future. Aside from all that, you will want to make sure that you definitely bring your, your hard shell for wind, rain, it's it's uh, the north it's very volatile even if you see sun in your forecast it can change fairly rapidly so just make sure you bring a hard shell for heavy wind heavy rain you never know when it'll come and you shouldn't expect that it's going to be perfect weather and also insulation whether you wear under your hard shell or when you're in the sleeping tent when you're eating or at the different campsites you'll want the insulation there just in case you will get cold it gets pretty cold in the evenings especially we actually often bring a heavy analyte insulation just in case now let's talk about the park itself tombstone park is one of three territorial parks in canada it is owned by the trondek wetchin first nation and operated by the first nation as well as the local territorial government the namesake of the park Tombstone Mountain is named that way because the shape of it is very unique and it resembles a tombstone. How did that mountain form? It actually is quite an interesting story. They all have their own unique story and the entire area used to be glaciated with a big old glacier sitting on top of it shearing away at a lot of the sidewalls of the mountains and over time those mountains either stayed sturdy or there was volcanic eruptions underneath the ground causing some very sophisticated and interesting lava flows which today you'll see kind of like the hexagonal shapes in the walls it is very fascinating to see and when you see those shapes and the interesting shapes along the walls these are the mountains that form from underground volcanic eruption and over time the side walls gave out and now you kind of see that 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 lava flow from under the ground now exposed as a mountain it's really cool also a little bit about the permafrost so the permafrost is that the ground never thaws it is supposed to be 
permanently frozen and that's why they call it permafrost. Because it is permanently frosted, you would think that no bushes or anything can survive, but there are some very small bushes, maybe some little bit of grass that grows very slowly and basically has very loose roots. Because they grow so slowly, the whole area is very easy and very fragile to destroy, basically walking on it, since they take like maybe hundreds of years to grow, walking on one small plant is destroying potentially hundreds of years of growth everything grows very slowly there but it is quite a different atmosphere to see you don't only really see trees it's just mostly these small little bushes for as far as the eye can see and some ferns and in the mountain areas one thing to note is over time there's growing concern of the permafrost starting to unfreeze or basically melt away at the top layer basically more and more of the soil is being exposed and in as the ice underneath melts trees are starting to come in and destroy those precious ferns especially around the rivers you'll start seeing when you're hiking in there you'll see some more interesting growth near water because the water kind of mediates the temperature and it's always moving it, it cre creates some level of friction and this is what kind of allows the trees to grow around the water and so you'll see usually when you see like any big bushes or trees usually there's water there too which is kind of interesting to see when you're there but due to the global warming there is growing concern of how that is going to ultimately affect the environment and and overall change the landscape of the park all right let's talk about the experience of hiking in the park first and foremost when you arrive you have to check in with the interpretive center the interpretive center sits right near the trailhead about a five minute drive and it is required to check in and you can check in any time before it could be the day before but you have to check in to make sure that you have the right bear cans they'll ask you to watch a training video on bear safety bear control and making sure that you can go into the park and keep it bear safe for others and also for you there's a lot of cool information in the interpretive center i do highly recommend taking the time to talk to the rangers they're very experienced they all know the area very well and they are full of great information and they have lots of history also in the interpretive center hiking through tombstone park there are three major campsites that you'll hike to there's Grizzly Lake, there's the Continental Divide, and then there's Talus Lake. All three being their own unique atmosphere, but they are all amazing campsites. When you get to them, you'll want to spend a little bit of time, even if you're not camping at them. I highly recommend if you're going there, you visit all three regardless, because they are all worth visiting and quite amazing to see. On your first day starting off, you'll start at the Grizzly Lake Trailhead and it won't be easy it's definitely the hardest day of all four days that you'll spend in the park and it starts off of a fairly strong 3300 uh, foot ascent or one kilometer climb uh, it is it's not the hardest that i mean there's always something harder and difficulties relative to the person experiencing it but I will say it's the day you're gonna have the heaviest bag and you got to take that heavy bag right up that ascent and it's about 8.3 miles and 13.3 kilometers to get to Grizzly Lake from the parking lot the campsite is quite a sight to behold you will often see rangers if not at the grizzly lake but i think you'll often see them in grizzly lake but you could see them along the trail or at the other campsites they'll be camping there as well and be full of information and lots of stories we we talked to several rangers while we were there and and they're full of stories also at grizzly lake there is an additional hike if you're up for it you can put your campsite down at these little stands they're propped up from the ground to protect the permafrosted land. And then once you unload your bag, you can go and do this additional hike. It's when you look at Grizzly Lake, you can go left, you'll see a trailhead and it's quite nice, uh, not very good view. And it really hits those wow moments. But of course it's pretty steep, but it's short and it is worthwhile doing if you have the energy. Then the next day, you'll be making your way to Continental Divide. And so this is the next campsite, and it's actually not too far away. The only thing that's separating you and the other campsite is this pretty steep ridge. Uh, if you talk to anyone that's been there, you'll know they have probably fond memories. 
it is also fairly steep. And then comes the descent. The descent uh, could also be a little challenging, but the most important thing is use those poles and go down slowly. You, you'll see that there's a lot of very small talus and it shifts a little bit, but the most important thing is take small steps, stay balanced and move down slowly, use those poles for extra balance. After you get down the descent, it's fairly smooth all the way to Continental Divide. It's kind of up and down, some boulders, some talus, but nothing super uh, memorable or jaw-dropping. And the view is okay. It is nice. You're kind. It is much better than the first day from my memory going to Grizzly Lake. Uh, but it's fairly, you know, it it uh, it'll fly by. And then you'll be at Continental Divide, which really opens up with a beautiful lake and a huge backdrop of the mountains. When we got to Continental Lake, we didn't stay there, but we took a moment to have lunch and it's a great spot. They have a restroom there to just kind of recharge. From there, the hike to Talus Lake is really smooth. It's, it's nearly flat. It's, it goes by really fast, but the one thing that I remember is this very muddy area. It, it is like, it's not just mud, it's kind of like quicksand, but it's not that bad. It's just... I, I went with trail runners and uh, not hiking boots and, and I didn't have them on tight enough so you have to be careful if your shoes are on tight they'll be pulled off by the mud it's pretty thick mud and so I just remember that vividly and then you know my my it went up to my knee almost and <laughs> you get pretty muddy but don't worry uh, there are streams after that I just found a stream and dunked my whole leg in there and that cleansed me of the mud uh, so it's not the worst, you'll just maybe have some wet shoes for a little while. And uh, as long as not hiking boots, I mean, hiking boots will take a little bit longer to dry. All these, uh, anyways, I'll probably go into another video at some point to talk about shoes. But, you know, there's some pros and cons to everything. From Grizzly Lake to Talos Lake, it totaled 2,300 feet ascending or 700 meters. So it is decently uh, steep in some areas, especially at Glissade Pass but it is definitely easier than the first day. The total distance was nine miles or 14.5 kilometer. Once you get to Talus Lake or Grizzly Lake or any of the campsites for that matter, you can go ahead and basically unpack your tent, take all of the garbage from your bag, anything with a scent, including sunscreen, lipstick, all those things, put them in the bear can. You can put the bear can into the locker and shut it and it'll be safe there from bears and, and also it's just always in that area. So it's a good thing to do early on, unpack your bag so that way you're not fidgeting around or forget to put things in there later on and it's just nice time to do right when you're unpacking your bag and putting up your tent. It's also worth noting along the way you'll see Grizzly Lake is the most busy because a lot of day hikers will hike into Grizzly Lake and also a lot of people will just go to Grizzly Lake and camp out. So camp into Grizzly Lake and then camp out. So it tends to be the most trafficked uh, campsite of them all and Talus is the least because it's also the, the hardest to get permits for, which I'll talk to in a minute. The Continental is kind of the next best thing if you can't get to uh, Talus Lake. I would say they all are nice, but the Talus is kind of the premium spot and it's often the, the first to go if, you, if you're trying to get the permits. The Continental is, is also quite nice. It has lots of campsites and if you go to the Continental, you can still do a day hike to Talus Lake and still enjoy. If you liked the video, be sure to smash that like button and follow along. My wife and I are constantly looking to give tips from our experiences, things that we've learned, and also share our experiences to help prepare you for your own adventure travel. Or we, con we are also individuals who work and travel as well. And so we've been able to have that work-life balance that I'm happy to share more on this channel. Let's talk about the permits. The permits are first come first served and they're done through an online system. So it's very important if you plan to go, you want to know a year in advance. <laughs> so if, you, if, if you're excited about this from this video or you've been wanting to go there for some time, make sure you mark your calendar, go to the website, I'll link it below, and make sure that you know when the dates are for when the permits will open because you'll want to mark that date and the exact time. 
the exact time because within 10 minutes the talus lake and maybe even continental will be sold out grizzly lake they have more campsites it'll go a little bit longer and but if you want to go i really re recommend doing the whole thing with that said the most important thing is to know the date and right when the time is you'll want to have your you be ready with a laptop good internet refresh that page and purchase that ticket use you know chrome tools or whatever browser of your preference to pre-fill a lot of the form and you just want to go through as fast as possible it, you, a lot of people are competing and doing this exact same thing so it's really just trying to fill out the form as fast as possible you know go for two nights at talus and or one night at talus and one night at continental whichever you prefer but go for your preferred fill out the form hit the booking ticket and you should be good to go you'll be proud that you have those permits because we met a lot of people who are really disappointed that they couldn't get it and they know how competitive so you know if you are going to take it seriously you have to plan ahead if you don't like planning you're probably not going to get those permits all right let's talk about bear dangers and risks there's two types of bears that you'll see in the area brown bears and black bears in the far north you'll hear stories of polar bears and a growlar, which is a polar bear and a brown bear mix, but those are so far north you don't have to worry about those. Black bears and brown bears for an intensive um, video, I'm just gonna call them bears. Uh, there's differences and, and they're important, but maybe for another video or maybe for this channel. Let me know if you'd like to hear more in the comments below and it's something we can always go into. The important bit as bears tend to have a defensive behavior and an offensive behavior and knowing the difference really determines how you need to react to that bear so the defensive behavior is done from great research on bears and generally how they defend their territory from other bears so the defensive behavior is when a bear feels threatened by something else you or another bear or something that feels that it's, it's equal it's matched in its its own capability and so defensive is often the default in most common behavior you'll see a bear but you don't have to so the thing first thing of bear safety is making sure the bear is aware of you you know bears are don't want they know what people are often and they don't like them uh we're we are scary to them and we should be and they'll just leave they're not pets you don't want to think that they're cuddly or try and take a selfie with them respect their power and but they respect us as well and we're both predators they will leave and go somewhere else so the most important thing for bear safety is make yourself known make be talking have a bear bell that's ringing uh and just be constantly kind of loud and obnoxious uh, when the bear in the bear territory so that the bear is notified oh there's a person there and you're not surprising it if there's a cub it'll gather her cubs and kind of go away the last thing you want to be is silent and then find your you know maybe you're listening to music or something's going on and you're not paying attention look up and there's a bear or a cub right next to you you look around there's a mama bear on the other side and now you're in between her and her cubs and she's very surprised and shocked you know that's <laughs> where you don't want to be so what you do in those kind of situations if you do surprise the bear is start backing off so it's defensive it doesn't it it's not sure how capable you are in terms of harming it and it's going to try and scare you off it could go all out and attack you but most likely it's going to be defensive and reading its its behaviors from there is going to be very important in most cases you want to make sure your hands are up don't be yelling at it start talking calmly whoa bear i'm here don't attack me please talk calmly to it and start backing away slowly don't back up in the direction of the cub just back away slowly if it charges you it's a defensive measure to basically size you up it could get on its two feet and it's going to get close in this case you could start reaching for your bear spray you if you are going to use the bear spray it has to be very close within you know, three meters and 
and, and you just want to take that thing and spray it right into its eyes. This will scare it and it'll go away in most cases. And so that's the last resort, but the bear mace isn't going to permanently hurt, hurt it. It's just going to get scared and it's going to hurt like hell. So it's going to dissuade it from doing anything critical at this moment and attacking you. With that said, continue to back up and just is just get some distance on the bear. Don't run. Don't ever turn your back to it. Just continue to back up until it starts going away. It's it's not really wanting to eat you. It's not really wanting you to do anything to you. It just wants you to go away and it wants to protect its cub. So make sure it can do that without you interfering as much as possible. Now for the next behavior. The next behavior is when a bear is comfortable with people and it has no fear of those people. This is when it's no longer defensive, where it you know thinks of another bear as an intimidation or a human as an intimidation. It doesn't need to be defensive anymore. It thinks you're prey and you're weak. This case can happen more common with black bears versus brown bears, interestingly enough, because black bears are around people more than grizzly bears. However, with that said, the most important identifier is its level of comfort with you. It will approach you, and bears are naturally curious, but in this case, it is too curious, and it's very comfortable with a human, and this is very alarming behavior. If it continues to come towards you, this is a situation that could be very threatening to you. If it's comfortably approaching you, that means that it could be hunting you. Maybe this is very curious, but you don't want to take the chance because that bear is very capable of hunting and it's very powerful. And so with that said, these are situations where you may have to be ready to fight for your life. You might want to, you know, have something in your hand. This is where it's okay to start yelling. You want to start trying to intimidate the bear. If you have a hiking pole, get the hiking pole, start swinging around. You want to also have your bear mace ready because that bear mace is going to hurt like hell and, and it's going to be very effective to turn to the bear. But you have to make sure it's close. If there's any wind or anything, it's going to really lower the effective uh, spray distance. And so often in sprays say they can go like 15 meters or, you know, very long distances. I, I highly advise you wait until they get very close and use it as a close distance measure of protection for best results. With that said, a bear becoming this hostile is very rare, but it is worth noting the behavior and if you need to, you no longer are going to start talking calmly to this thing. You need to threaten it. You need to be aggressive. You need to show I'm a more dominant predator and you need to try and convince it that it needs to fear you. So it's important to know the difference between when a bear is being defensive and offensive. Don't be too scared about the bears. The park hasn't seen a bear there in the last 10 years, and because people have been doing a good thing about bear control, the bears have no reason to come there. There's not any big game there, and it's, it's quite out of the way for them. And so continue that tradition, and we'll keep bears away in the Tombstone Park. Animals you will see quite commonly, especially if you're looking for them, are marmots, ground squirrels, pikas, and ptarmigans, which I call the mountain chicken. All right, let's talk about the Northern Lights. The Northern Lights are a phenomenon to be seen, and I, I've seen them in Iceland, and I've seen them on a couple of other occasions. They are phenomenal to see, but when you're in Tombstone, if you're going there for hiking, the chances of you seeing it are very small. Don't get your hopes up. It's probably not likely, because the season you're gonna go there and explore the park is not the season for the Northern Lights. The you're far north and so the when it's the summertime the days are can be as long as 24 hours it can be all day all the time and you're not going to see the northern lights unless it's nighttime so the great time to go there is when it's nighttime 24 hours and so that's the secret but there's also the chance of uh, you have to have enough solar radiation coming at the earth from the sun to and that isn't constant and, it, and there are definitely fluctuations with that happening and so you have to know when the solar storms are be reading it and and time that very well but just because the the season for hiking tombstone is the season when there's no snow it's warmer in the area which tends to be like three months long it's, it's not it's a very uh, not a very forgiving area and so it's not very livable outside of those three months and 
And so that's when you'll be there. And I just want to go ahead and pad. You have a chance of seeing them, but not a very good one. And so don't let that be the reason you're there. It's just call it a bonus if you get to see them. Lastly, I want to end on Dawson City. Dawson City is like a two hour drive away and it's definitely worth a visit, especially after being in the area without a shower for four days. Oh, I forgot to mention that. The area doesn't have any showers. It does have really nice restrooms, but no showers. And so Dawson City will be quite a lifesaver when you get there and can take a shower. It just feels so awesome. However, the Dawson City isn't great for just a shower. There's a lot of great food you know, after you've been having your dried meals or you know whatever you brought on your camping uh, backpacking experience. It will be nice to return to normal and have a nice meal and Dawson City will not disappoint. There's a lot of restaurants there and, and actually quite nice ones to be honest. And another thing about Dawson too is there's a couple, there's a few things to do. They have this, uh, you can go up on this hillside and see the whole Dawson City. The, which Dawson City has a fascinating history too is the gateway for a lot of the gold miners when the Yukon Gold Rush began. It was kind of like a central hub for where people would come and, and start their experience and then go off into wilderness looking for gold. And so that's really cool to see. And you know, you can see all that from the hillside along with the nice sunset and there's a bunch of paragliders that'll be throwing themselves off the cliff too and, and uh, having a nice view of the paragliding over the city. And not to mention uh, Dawson City itself is quite a amazing city. They've kept the historical look and feel of the city back when it was created. Now, like I said, it was a pop-up city to aid in that gold rush. And since people stayed there, and it's, 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 it's quite amazing that they've preserved it so well. And they have a lot of history there too. You can walk in and really get an experience. It, it was funny, like when we were in going through the park, we asked a lot of uh, locals uh, where they would recommend to eat in Dawson City. And so we heard a lot about the Bonton. It's almost 100% of people recommend it. And so we wanted to eat at a Bonton, however, we went there and winged it and no dice. They are quite busy. So I would highly recommend if you know the dates are going to be in Dawson City, make sure you have a reservation of on time and, and have a good time. Uh, we didn't get to eat there, but and there are enough people recommended it that I feel I can trust that.